And finally, in this unit, I'd like to show you some very simple examples of this algorithm in practice and also guiding towards the exercise tasks. While then in the next lecture, we're going to consider more realistic examples with um, real problems such as stereo matching. So the first example that I want to show you is this vehicle localization example that I've already alluded to in the first part. So the goal here now at a bit longer time horizon is to estimate the vehicle location at 10 different time instances. So these are the time instances from left to right, T1 to 10, where we state of each of these random variables, we have one random variable at each time step. Um, these are ternary variables, so they can take um, three different states, lane one, lane two, or lane three, depending on if the vehicle is at lane one, two, or three at uh, this particular time step. So for this particular situation that we see here, we have this particular configuration of random variables at the bottom. So we have 10 random variables here, um, where each of them can take state one, two, or three. Now, in addition to this, we have observations. Observations we specify as continuous um, uh, probability scores where we have an observation for each time step and uh, we specify with which probability the vehicle is observed at a particular lane for that time step. So for instance, for the first time step, we observe the vehicle with 70% probability. Our perception model is confident that this is on lane one, but there's also some probability for lane two and even more for lane three. So we have now converted simply this numerical representation into a more easily um, easy to understand graphical representation. We can do the same for the other observations. So let's assume these are the observations. And what happens, of course, if, if we just naively take the most likely state independently at each time step, according to the perception model, we see such a result where we already have, we have a very uh, implausible transition here, a transition that's physically implausible and that we try to avoid now by integrating this prior knowledge using with the help of graphical models, because this is not a very plausible inference result. Instead, this is a more plausible inference result it's uh, a little bit less likely under the perception model, but it's much more likely under the prior knowledge, under the prior that we have about the world. The factor graph of this problem looks like this. We have the unaries that specify um, or that are determined by the perception model, the observations. These are called F. And then we have, and these are different here, F1 to F10, because we have different potentials, different observations at the time, each time step. But then we have a, a G that's the same and that's connecting nearby time steps, X1 and X2, X2 and X3. So there's a pairwise potential that connects two. So the um, distribution can be written or factored according to uh, this Markov random or this factor graph here into this representation. The unary factors we directly take as the observation probability scores. So for instance, 0 0.7 for the first lane, um, 0 0.2 and 0 0.1 and so on. The question is now, how should we choose the pairwise factors? And of course, ideally we want to learn these um, pairwise factors. This is in this case is a three by three matrix because we have three states for the first variable and three states for the second variable and so we have a three by three probability table here and the right thing to do here is now to have some training data and learn the optimal parameters from this data and this is what we're going to cover in lecture seven but now for the purpose of this lecture where we just discuss inference we assume that this is given to us and let's assume that 
this is somehow uh, reasonable. And reasonable means that, well, the highest probability is um, maybe that we just stay on the lane because that happens most frequently. And then there is some probability for a transition of lanes, but not only to the adjacent lanes, not to uh, by two lanes, which is physically completely implausible. So we have a zero probability here, or the potential is zero here. Now, if we use this model, that combines this unary with these pairwise terms. And we now do some product inference and look at the marginal distributions, we obtain this result. And you can already see that compared to the observations, the probability for lane three in this particular state here at this particular time has changed completely. All right, so you can see how this prior knowledge is incorporated into the solution. Now this was the marginal solution, but we can also apply the um, max product algorithm to obtain the maximum a posteriori solution. And this is the map solution that we get. This is the solution that we wanted. And that's the solution that we get if we use exactly this um, smoothness or pairwise term that we've just introduced. A second example is image denoising. Let's assume we bought a camera, but the camera is is not so good. <laughs> the camera is a black and white camera. It has just 10 by 10 pixels, 100 pixels in total. And not even that, it actually takes very noisy images. So this is what you want to take, but this is what you actually take. So now the question is, how can we go from this noisy image to the clean image? And that's called image denoising. And we can use the same properties that we have seen in the stereo matching class that namely uh, nearby pixels are more likely to have the same value than to have different values. Now, not in terms of disparity maps, but here in, in terms of RGB value or binary pixel values. So if we model this using a Markov random field, and if we just assume unary potentials, this is what the model would look like. We have 100 variables because we have 100 pixels here. They are binary. And we just have unary potentials. And uh, we specify these unary potentials such that um, we have this, this is again the Everson bracket. So we have this indicator here that says, well, this potential is equal to one if the variable takes the value of the observation. So for instance, here, if we get a black pixel, that's good. Here, if we get a white pixel, that's good. This is our observation. And we have used here the log representation. So these potentials here are log factors. So the probability distribution is one over C, the product of these factors equal to one over C of X of the sum over these log factors. So we are directly specify this problem now in contrast to example one here, we directly specified in terms of these log factors, which we of course can do. And, and again, for solving the inference problem, of course, we, we pass log mes messages as well. Now, if we do that, what is the outcome? Well, the outcome is unfortunately the same image, the noisy image, because we have not assumed any prior knowledge. We have just said, well, we have these unary constraints at each pixel. And of course, every pixel, if we maximize this, this is maximized by maximizing individually each of these unary potentials, which is simply maximized by setting the variable to the observation. So what we do want to ins do instead now is to integrate prior knowledge by adding constraints to this problem. So what prior knowledge do we have about this image? Assume we, we know what images typically look like, assume we have some images like this. Well, one thing that was already mentioned is that well, neighboring pixels tend to have the same label, but can we make this a little bit more concrete? Can we quantify this? How many neighbors actually share the same label? Let's look at this pixel grid here and let's find all the edges that are separating pixels with different color. And these are indicated here in red. If we count this number of edges or transitions, this is where now later the potentials are going to be defined. They are defined at 
uh, between two pixels, so they are going to cross these edges, we see that we have, well, first of all, 180 neighborhood relationships in total. So there's 180 edges here because we have 10 by 10 times 2, one for the bottom and one for the right, and minus 20 because uh, uh, the picture ends. So this is 100 edges, little gray edges in total, but then we have only these uh, these red edges, we have only 34. So there's only 34 edges where we have a transition from black to white, while there is 146 edges where the transition is from black to black or white to white, so the label is the same. So there's, in other words, a factor of 4.3 more transitions where the label stays constant compared to transitions where the label changes. And now, of course, we can exploit this by introducing a smoothness assumption by saying, well, it's more likely that adjacent pixels are the same. And in the ca in the simple discrete case, we just consider a very simple um, model for this. So here we have again the model with the unary potentials, but now also adding these pairwise potentials on the four connected grid. Here we look only at a MRF that's a that's, uh, three by three sub image here but of course you have to imagine this as continuing to a 10 by 10 grid in the same structure as we see here. The unaries um, are the same as before but now we have the pairwise potentials that are defined um, as such. They're defined such that if uh, on uh, two adjacent, so this means adjacent neighboring sites if for two adjacent pixels the state the inferred state is the same xi equals xj then we have a one otherwise we have a zero and we multiply this with alpha which is the strength of this regularizer that is a hyperparameter of the model if you make it too strong then all the pixels will turn to the same value if you make it too weak if you make it zero then we get the observation spec because we effectively disabling this term but you can already see now we have a trade-off. The model or the inference algorithm has to do a trade-off. It has to weight the um, observations um, with respect to the smoothness constraints. And it cannot fulfill both. Either it fulfills the observations and has ones here everywhere, or it sacrifices some of these ones here. It makes some of these inferred variables not the same as the observations in order to obtain more um, reward <laughs> to obtain more ones uh, on on the on the pairwise potential side here because we only obtain a one if two adjacent sites are the same and otherwise we obtain a zero here so we have this trade-off now and the parameter alpha controls the strength of the prior and we will implement this and play with this in the exercise and then next time we're gonna talk about how these graphical models um, are used in more um, advanced problems like, like stereo estimation and so on with larger label sets or multi-view reconstruction where you have also um, larger potentials, potentials beyond pairwise potentials. Let's stop here. Thanks. <laughs>